lectures here in World History. Today we're going to kick off our unit on the Age of Exploration. What we really want to establish here is why Europeans went exploring, uh, where they went, and how that was even possible. Um, but this proceeds uh, knowing that North and South America exist. So our outcome today is Europeans explore the East, specifically China, Japan, and India, regions like that. So we've got one constructive response question we're going to look at today. The question says, summarize the European motivations for trans-oceanic trade as well as the innovations that allowed them to travel further. Uh, so we're going to talk about really two things that are going to help us answer that question. Um, we're going to talk about their motivation being God, glory, and gold. You're going to understand what that's all about. As well as we're going to talk about the caravel and the sextant, which are two new innovations, one being a ship and one being an instrument used on a ship that will help Europeans travel further. So we'll absolutely have everything we need to answer that question by the end of this lecture. So to really put our roadmap out there, what will we learn? Uh, we'll look at new innovations in sailing. That's going to be the caravel. Uh, we'll talk about how Portugal leads the way, we'll look at how Spain joins in, and we'll also look at the Dutch. Those are the three main countries that really kick off this uh, enthusiasm to go exploring and trading and trying to make money. So that's what we're going to look at here today. So let's set the stage here. First and foremost, we have to understand that exploration had been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Europeans had been exploring via the Crusades and with people like Marco Polo uh, for quite a long time now. The difference is they were doing a lot of this by land rather than by sea. That's what's going to change in our story here today. For the most part, Europeans really had no interest or ability to explore foreign lands. I mean, think of the average peasant, think of the average knight uh, in the Middle Ages or even in the, the Renaissance era. They wouldn't have had the money to be able to pursue buying a large ship, putting together a crew, and going out and exploring. So the average European really didn't do this. This is going to be more state-sanctioned, coming from those with wealth, uh, kings, queens, princes, things like that. So by the 1400s, by the time the Renaissance had started to kick off, a desire for wealth, coupled with advanced sailing techniques, sparked exploration. Once people realized they could go further, and once they realized there was a reason to go further, then you're going to start seeing people trying to make this happen. Um, so we're going to look at some of those sailing techniques, as well as some of the wealth brought back that would really spark that interest. So, Europeans seek new trade routes. Well, of course, the main desire for exploration for most people were new sources of wealth. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about God, glory, and gold throughout this process. Um, God, glory, and gold refers to the fact that uh, many Europeans wanted to spread Christianity. That's the God part. The glory part is they wanted to make a name for themselves. Um, and the gold part, of course, is making money. And I'd say the, the money part is the biggest piece here. So new sources of wealth, trying to find spices and luxury goods from Asia, really was uh, a, big, a big deal for people because they could make literally, um, you know, 60 times the amount of money that they paid on the initial voyage. They could get that back, uh, which means uh, they were going to be very wealthy in the end. So demand was much higher than the supply, which meant merchants could charge higher prices. Anytime you have anything in supply and it sells quickly, that means demand's very high for it. The more things you sell, the more money you make. So if you have a, a demand that's higher than the supply, people are going to really try to um, climb over each other to, to buy these things. So, uh, of course, you want to go get more of that those goods in supply so you can make more money. It's just the laws of economics, supply and demand here. So England, Spain, Portugal, and France wanted to bypass the Italian merchants uh, and find these new sea routes for themselves. You have to think about it this way. The Italians, because of those Italian city-states, because of the merchant class that had developed there, really were the heart of trade in Europe, um, you know, at the Renaissance Reformation era. So if you wanted to buy something that you couldn't get in Europe most times, you had to buy them from Italian merchants who traded for these goods. Of course, if you buy it from anybody, they mark it up. So it's the age-old idea. If you want to buy something and turn around and sell it, you're always going to sell it for more than what you bought it for. So think about it. 
all these goods that are coming into Europe, they've got a large markup on them. It's like when you buy something from Target. Let's say Target buys an Xbox from Microsoft for 100 bucks. Of course, they're going to try to charge you 105 maybe $200, maybe even $500 for it. Uh, there's always a markup on goods. So England, Spain, Portugal, and France said, let's not buy our stuff from the Italians. Let's go get it for ourselves, and we will save money. Now, I told you about God, glory, and gold. So we definitely have to make sure we uh, talk about the God piece here. Europeans also use Christianity as a means to travel. They wanted to convert non-Christians to Christianity throughout the world. Uh, and that's still going on in the world today. So we call those missionaries. Many people traveled not so much to make money, but to go tell people who had never heard of Christianity all about Jesus, all about the Bible, and try to convert them to Christians. So, tools of exploration. Well, European ships improved with technology. And there's a little bit of information in your textbook on page 531 about this, but we're going to look at here at the new vessel called the Caravel. The Caravel is a game changer for a lot of different reasons. First of all, it's a much sturdier ship, which means it can handle the hard seas a lot better. Prior to this, and we're talking around the 1400s here, ships didn't cross oceans. They just weren't built strong enough to do that or to go long distances. The Caravel is going to change that. The Caravel also had triangular sails, which are much stronger against the wind. So you can imagine that's going to carry you further. You're not going to have to worry about tattered and torn sails as much. Uh, your, your triangular sails are just better equipped for that. Now, the Caravel is also going to have a large cargo area. The main advantage here, of course, is you can bring more supplies and you can bring more goods back with you, which means you can make more money. And the last one is the way the Caravel was built, it sat shallower in the water. It had a shallow draft, which allowed uh, it to explore closer to the shore. You can imagine if you've got a big heavy ship that sits deep in the water, you got to be careful so you don't bottom out and rip open the bottom of your ship and sink. But now you've got a ship that sits higher in the water, you can be closer to land, and of course land is where your fresh water is, land is where your supplies are, and of course land is where your trading hubs are, where you're likely trying to make money. The other tool of exploration that is in, um, introduced here is the sextant. The sextant is an instrument that was used to determine latitude and longitude. And I'm going to show you both of these on the next slide here. Um, here we've got the caravel. You can see the triangular sails. You can see how it would be sitting higher in the water. It's just a bigger ship, uh, a better ship, pioneered, as you can see here, by the Portuguese. So when we get into this, the Portuguese really are going to uh, kind of set the curve in terms of traveling and trade. Here's the sextant, little device used. Now you can kind of chart where you've been. You can chart where you're going. You can use this uh, to help make better maps. It's really definitely going to be an important device um, for people going long distances in the age of exploration. So uh, as we look at those who actually go out and explore, we're, we're going to start with Portugal here. Now, Portugal is an interesting area. I always suggest that it, it's odd to me that Portugal was never taken over here by Spain or vice versa, Portugal taking over Spain. They've remained two separate countries with two different languages for quite a long time. And to me, just, you know, historically speaking, I think that's somewhat remarkable. But anyway, Portugal is going to be the one who leads the way in this whole age of exploration. And it all starts with this guy, Prince Henry the Navigator. He was known for building schools of navigation. He himself didn't go exploring, but he's going to help um, finance these voyages that really gets this whole age of exploration started. So let's start with looking at how Portugal leads the way. So Portugal led the way in sailing innovations. As we talked about, we looked at the caravel, we looked at the sextant. Without those two things, Portugal is not able to go and explore. They became the first country to establish trading outposts on the west coast of Africa. You can picture this on a map, and I'm going to show you a couple of maps here momentarily, but the west coast of Af Africa, in a way, is directly south of, uh, of Portugal. Um, so you have some of these sailing voyages um, going south, but it's what's going to happen next that's really kind of a game changer in terms of how far Europeans can go.
So Prince Henry, who was obviously son of the king, as his title suggests, was Portugal's most enthusiastic exploration explorer. And what he's going to do is he's going to want to try to get a lot of these treasures that he knows is over, is, exist over in Asia, but he's also very Christian. Um, so he's going to try to spread Christianity. So here it says Prince Henry wanted to reach the treasures of the East and spread Christianity. And again, let me remind you that the East refers to really the area of China, Japan, and India. Of course, if you wanted to travel there prior to this point in time, you had to go by land. And by traveling by land can take a very long time. You have to make a lot of stops. You have to bring a lot of water and supplies. Um, but sh sailing by ship now offers new adventure and new routes uh, to get to these places that the Europeans wanted to reach. So here's a map, Prince Henry's navigate, uh, nav the, Prince Henry the Navigator's routes. Here you can see Portugal traveling south to the west coast of Africa. That was a pretty big trip for this point in time. But things are going to get much more complicated and much more profitable, as you're about to find out. So next, as we continue on this, Prince Henry hires a guy named Vasco da Gama, who you see here. Vasco da Gama sailed to the eastern side of Africa and reached southwest India. That does not say Swindia, it says southwest India. This is a big deal. He's the first really to round the tip of Africa and hit the eastern side. While he was there, da Gama and his crew were astonished by all the great stuff they could find. Spices and silks and gems, all this great stuff in India. Now, what really strikes this whole thing off, what really sets this uh, voyage apart from all the other ones before it, is it, it's a long trip. But it's incredibly profitable. So da Gama's remarkable 27,000 mile journey ended up being worth 60 times the cost of the trip, and it provided Portugal with a direct sea route to India. Imagine that. Any trip you take, whatever you spend, let's say it's $1,000, you know you're going to come back with $60,000, chances are pretty good you're going to make that trip as frequently as you possibly can. Despite the length of it, it was very, very profitable. So now the Portuguese are really excited to want to go to India and to go to the east. They know there's a lot of good stuff that they can trade for, bring back, and make a lot of money off of. So here's a look at da Gama's route, 1497 to 1499, traveling from Portugal here all the way around the tip of Africa, reaching southwest India right here. So that's where we're going to stop part one. When we come back with part two, we're going to look at how Spain joins in and eventually how the Dutch uh, get involved as well. So go ahead and hit stop and queue up part two.